Welcome to this embryology class. I call it section two of the lecture series on development of the head and neck structures. And in this section two, we are going to focus on development of the endocrine glands of the head and neck region. In particular, we are going to focus on the thyroid gland parathyroid gland and the pituitary glands. Just to remind you a bit about the lecture series of head and neck development, I particularly prefer dividing into four parts. In the first part, I prefer to talk about pharyngeal apparatus and their derivatives. And uh, my hope is that uh, if you are listening to this second part, then it means you most likely have already listened to the first part of that lecture on pharyngeal apparatus and their derivatives. The second part of the lecture is what you are focusing on this part in this particular lecture, where we now look at development of endocrine glands of the head and neck region, focusing on thyroid, parathyroid, and pituitary gland. That perhaps the shortest of the lecture series, the way I've divided them. In the third part of the lecture series, which we'll do next time, I prefer focusing on development of the facial structures, including the palate and the tongue as well. And uh, in the last part, we look at development of the eye as well as development of the ear. That bit long but uh, fine i prefer doing it in one lecture so in this lecture of development of the endocrine glands of head and neck we are going to address three major objectives the first major objective is to talk about the embryonic origins the developmental sequence and congenital malformations of the thyroid gland. That will take us some time. After that, we'll say something about embryonic sources and variant anatomy of the parathyroid glands. You notice that I'm now using the term variant anatomy as opposed to congenital malformation, and there's a reason for that. I'll clarify that later. And lastly, I prefer just mentioning the embryonic sources of the pituitary gland, not necessarily going into the details of the developmental processes. So let's start with the development of the thyroid gland. The thyroid gland begins its development in the floor of the primitive pharynx. So remember, in the pharyngeal apparatus, we talked about the fact that there are some pharyngeal arches that surround the embryonic pharynx, that primitive pharynx. The floor of the embryonic pharynx is where the tongue is supposed to develop. And so on that dorsum of the tongue, the dorsum of the tongue therefore constitute the floor of the primitive pharynx. That tongue has not yet developed as well, it's just the primordial tongue. So when the tongue is beginning to develop in the floor of the primitive pharynx, the dorsum of the tongue is where the third gland also begins to develop. That should be a little surprising because the adult thyroid, you know where it is located in the anterior lower neck. Yet, the site of origin of its development is somewhere in the dorsum of the tongue, that site that is called foramen cecum. And in a short while, we are going to see why it's a foramen in the adult. In terms of the tissues of origin, the floor of the primitive pharynx is lined by endodermal layer. So basically the endodermal cells 
on the flow of the primitive pharynx are the ones which give rise to the different the, the various cells of the thyroid gland. Now let me clarify this way. We know that thyroid gland has in particular two key functional cells without necessarily talking about the stromal tissue. The parenchymal tissue of the thyroid gland contain the follicular cells and the parafollicular cells. The follicular cells of the thyroid gland, which are the majority, are the ones which arise from the endodermal layer in the dorsum of the primitive pharynx. Sorry, in the dorsum of the tongue or the flow of the primitive pharynx. So the endoderm layer gives rise to the follicular cells of the thyroid gland. Remember, these are the cells that secrete T3 and T4. But there's another function or cell type which is still within the thyroid parenchyma, and that is the parafollicular cells, the cells that secrete the calcitonin hormone. The calcitonin secreting cells do not necessarily come from the dorsum of the tongue, but arise from the ultimobrachial body. In the previous lecture on pharyngeal apparatus, we mentioned about the ultimobranchial body, and we said the ultimobranchial body are basically remnants of what was supposed to be the fifth pharyngeal pouch, but because the fifth pharyngeal arch disappeared, what was supposed to be the fifth pouch therefore joined the fourth pouch. And so the ultimobranchial body are basically the lower part of the fourth pouch. The cells in the ultimobranchial body are derived from neurocrest cells. So those neurocrest cells of the ultimobranchial body are the ones which give rise to the parafollicular cells of the thyroid gland. So in terms of the tissues of origin, we talk about the endodermal cells and the neurocrest cells, which give rise to the parenchymal tissue of the thyroid gland. Just like in any other part of the body, the connective tissue elements of the thyroid gland will therefore come from mesenchymal cells. Just like in any other part of the body, connective tissue arises from mesenchymal tissue. So the mesenchyme around is the one that will be responsible for giving rise to the stromal elements in the gland. So in this image, we see the different pharyngeal pouches, the first, second, third, and fourth pharyngeal pouch. In particular, in this fourth pharyngeal pouch, we see this part, the blue part, being the ultimobranchial body. And in this ultimobranchial body, the cells within this ultimobranchial body are the ones which migrate and invade the developing thyroid gland so that they'll contribute to the parafollicular cells of the thyroid gland. Yet, the follicular cells come from the dorsum of the tongue, and that means that we'll expect some migration downwards so that now the thyroid gland should be where in the adult it is. All that's clear about the embryonic origin of the thyroid gland. Now let's talk about the <coughs> developmental sequence. Once this gland has begun to form within the dorsum of the tongue, what happens? So this is what happens. At the site of origin of the third gland in the dorsum of the tongue, so let's assume this to be the developing tongue, the cells responsible for giving rise to the third gland proliferate and migrate downwards. So it's a downward proliferation. We call that proliferation of endoderm the thyroid diverticulum. And we are called diverticulum because it's a growth away from the surface of the tongue. It's a growth downwards 
from the floor of the primitive pharynx. That diverticulum is the one that's giving us the thyroid gland. So what happens is that these cells, therefore, proliferate and descend, which means go through the substance of the tongue, through the substance of the tongue to below the tongue. The diverticulum descends. And in the descent pathway, the gland actually migrates away from the tongue in front of the hide bone. And so we see this as the third diverticulum or the primordium. We'll expect this to grow downwards anterior to the developing hyoid bone. Remember, most likely hyoid bone is also not fully developed at this time, but it is still developing. So the thyroid grows and migrates anterior to the hyoid bone. This image shows us the location of where the thyroid gland came from, from the floor of the primitive pharynx. And this other image shows us the thyroid diverticulum, the way it grows down as it migrates away from the dorsum of the tongue downwards. Now, important to note is that as the thyroid gland is migrating downwards, there's a tract of it that it's leaving behind. The tract of it that's leaving behind is known as the thyroglossal duct. So this is the tract that the gland is leaving behind as it migrates downwards anterior to the hyoid bone and still migrating downwards. The tract that it's leaving behind is known as the thyroglossal duct. Thyro for thyroid and glossal for the tongue, the glossus. So it's a duct connecting the thyroid gland and the tongue. That's why it's known as the thyroglossal duct. Now, as the gland descends downwards, at some point the gland will then begin to divide into the right and the left lateral lobes. These lobes are not fully separated from each other and so there's a narrow connection between the two lobes which we then term the isthmus. So in this image we see the gland has divided into two lateral lobes and there's a narrow point, maybe not fully narrow as we'd have expected yet but it will still narrow down. This narrow part or narrowing part is what will become the isthmus of the thyroid gland while these are the two lateral lobes. <clears throat> During this descent pathway, it is at that time when that is happening that the cells of the ultimobranchial body also invade the descending cells of the thyroid gland. And so therefore, those cells of the ultimobranchial body invade the developing gland so that those cells will then form part of the parafollicular cells of the thyroid gland, the calcitonin secreting cells of the thyroid gland. Those are not the only ones that move towards the third gland. We would also expect the parathyroid glands also to migrate in that manner. But we'll talk about the parathyroid glands shortly. Remember that there was a duct connecting the two. The thyroglossal duct. The thyroglossal duct usually after the full migration of the gland, the thyroglossal duct involutes. That is to mean it disappears or degenerates. Although the duct degenerates, the most cranial part of the duct does not quite degenerate. So what happens? It will remain as a small pit on the dorsum of the tongue. And that is what we are calling the foramen cecum. So the foramen cecum is basically the cranial remnant 
of the embryonic thyroglossal duct. And it is the evidence, the anatomical evidence of the embryonic origin of the tongue on the dorsum of the tongue. Sorry, the embryonic origin of the thyroid gland from the dorsum of the tongue. So that is the thyroglos that is the foramen cecum and this is the thyroglossal duct which is supposed to have involuted. The lowermost part of the thyroglossal duct may also not in particular involute. However, that lowermost part of it may contain glandular tissue of the thyroid gland. And the glandular tissue of the thyroid gland that follows the thyroglossal duct is what we call the pyramidal lobe of the thyroid gland. So the pyramidal lobe is basically the most caudal part of what was supposed to be the thyroglossal duct, which then became glandular. It is present not in every person, but in a few individuals. Right, so having talked about how the thyroid gland develops. Let's now talk about the malformations of the thyroid gland. And the first malformation I want to talk about are malformations which are based on abnormal migratory path of the thyroid gland. So basically let's call them anomalies due to a defective migration process. If you follow that the gland is supposed to come from the dorsum of the tongue and migrate downwards up to the anterior lower neck in front of the trachea, then we'll easily understand the malformations due to abnormal migration. Think through it. Maybe the gland has fully refused or failed to descend. If the thyroid gland fails to descend, it means that the gland will be on the dorsum of the tongue. In particular, the gland will be on the tongue. And that's what we call lingual thyroid gland. So there are some individuals who have their thyroid gland within the tongue. It can appear like a mass, as you can see here. You might think it's a tumor. But when we image, we will see that it's actually thyroid tissue. Maybe it descended a bit but remain within the tongue so that's what we'll call intralingual thyroid. Or maybe it migrated through the tongue but above the hyoid bone so that's what we call the suprahyoid thyroid. Or maybe it migrated just below the hyoid but still way up and that's what we call the infrahyoid thyroid. Or it was overzealous. If it was overzealous, it means it migrated even beyond where it's supposed to be. So if it goes beyond where it's supposed to be, where will it be? Definitely within the thorax. But of course not anterior to the sternum. It will go behind the sternum. And that is what we call retrosternal thyroid. So a retrosternal thyroid is thyroid that is usually behind the sternum it could be just behind the manubrium of the sternum or slightly below usually it will be found in the superior mediastinum so all those are basically ectopic thyroid glands thyroid glands which are not where they're supposed to be Apart from ectopic thyroid gland, we may also have malformations due to persistence of the thyroglossal duct. I prefer calling them thyroglossal duct malformations. Understand that the thyroglossal duct is supposed to disappear except the most cranial part which become foramen cecum. Suppose the parts of the thyroglossal duct, and especially this middle zone that is supposed to disappear, does not disappear, what happens? If it just a small section of the duct not disappearing, yet 
cranial and lower part disappear, then the region of the duct that is persisting will be just an enclosed pocket without any draining tract. So an enclosed pocket will form a cyst with time. And so we call that one thyroglossal duct cyst. However, it's also possible that uh, the duct is opening on a surface on one side. So if you have it opening on one particular surface, then we call that a sinus. If we have it opening on both surfaces, then we call it a fistula. The term fistula applies to an abnormal tract that is joining two epithelial surfaces. And the term sinus refers to an abnormal tract with a blind end. The term cyst is an enclosed uh, cavity without a draining tract. So you may have thyroglossal duct, cyst, sinus, or fistula. The third category of malformations of the thyroid gland are largely what I'll call variations rather than congenital malformations per se. So we expect a number of things here. You may have presence of a pyramidal lobe. I'll want to call that a variation rather than an abnormality. You may have absence of the isthmus. You may have absence of a lobe. So the isthmus is there and one lobe is there, but one lobe is missing. Or you may have absence of a lobe as well as an isthmus. So only one lateral lobe is present. All these are variations in thyroid morphology. Great. So that's the story of the thyroid gland. Now let's narrow down to the parathyroid glands. As we agreed, our objective here is to talk about the embryonic sources as well as the variations of the parathyroid glands. From the previous lecture on pharyngeal apparatus, we may have alluded to something to do with this. Pretty much similar. Parathyroid glands originate from the endoderm of the third and fourth pharyngeal pouches. So here we have the pharyngeal pouches. This is the third pouch and this is the fourth pouch. Each of the pouches have a cranial and a caudal part of them. The parathyroid glands originate from the cranial parts of both pouches. But how they contribute is very unique and I want you to understand it. The cranial part of the fourth pharyngeal pouch is the one that gives us the superior parathyroid glands. And then the cranial part of the third pharyngeal pouch is the one that gives rise to the inferior parathyroid glands. I hope you've noticed that there's some interchange. We would have expected the fourth pouch to give us the inferior glands and the third pouch to give us the superior glands, but that's not the case. Now, how do we explain this phenomenon? This phenomenon is best explained by using the third pouch. Yes, in as much as we'd have expected the third pouch to be the one giving us the superior glands, it doesn't. And the reason why it doesn't is this, that the third pouch also gives rise to the thymus gland. So let me call the thymus rather than thymus gland. The third pouch also gives rise to the thymus. The thymus 
has a very long migratory path because you know where the thymus is. It should be again now in the anterior mediastinum or maybe superior mediastinum anteriorly. So it's behind the sternum. In simple terms, the thymus is in the thorax. Migrating all the way from the neck up to the thorax, that's a very long migratory path. Now, remember that this third pouch, which is giving rise to the thymus, is also meant to give rise to a parathyroid gland. In its migratory path, this very long migratory path, the thymus is therefore assumed to be pulling along the parathyroid glands, which were also arising from the third pharyngeal pouch. So it's because of this longer migratory path downwards that the parathyroid glands which are coming from the third pouch are also having that longer migratory path downwards and that therefore displaces them to a level below where the parathyroid glands which come from the fourth pouch will be located it is for that reason therefore that the third pharyngeal pouch will give rise to the inferior parathyroid glands and the fourth pharyngeal pouch to give rise to the superior parathyroid glands. In this image we see a summary of what I've told you. So well, from the foramen cecum site, the thyroid glands migrated down. Then from the ultimobranchial body we had invasion of the parafollicular cells the thyroid from the fourth pharyngeal pouch we have the superior parathyroid glands then from the third pharyngeal pouch because of this longer path of migration the parathyroid glands which came from here also pulled by the migration of the thymus because of that these glands are displaced at a more inferior location and so they become the inferior parathyroid glands as the thymus still go down to the thorax having said so this image summarizes that quite well just remember that the ones which are up go down and the ones which are down go up and that's a simpler way of remembering the embryonic sources of the parathyroid glands. Remember it's third and fourth pouch, the cranial components of both. So these are the glands, these are the parathyroid glands. We expect to have two superior parathyroid glands and two inferior parathyroid glands, a total of four parathyroid glands. With that understanding, we can now talk about the variations of the parathyroid gland. Now, the variations of the parathyroid glands may be more common. And one of them is basically we may have ectopic parathyroid gland. This largely affects the inferior parathyroid glands more than the superior parathyroid glands and so when the parathyroid glands are ectopic the inferior ones it may also with, be with the thymus the thymus also ectopic because they have the same embryonic source and they have the longest migratory path so the reason why the inferior parathyroid glands are the ones most commonly affected in ectopia is because of the longer migratory path that they do have. It can be anywhere around the neck. Sometimes the glands are deep within the thyroid gland and that's what we call the intrathyroid parathyroid gland. It means they are not just on the surface posterior to the thyroid lobes but deep inside the thyroid gland. Sometimes there are even more than four. You can use the term supernumerary 
parathyroid glands or accessory parathyroid gland. If there are more than four, maybe all of them are attached to the thyroid gland or maybe some of them are not on the thyroid gland but somewhere around there. And lastly, you may have congenital absence of the parathyroid glands. These again commonly affect the inferior ones. And in the congenital absence of the parathyroid glands, it may also be associated with congenital absence of the thymus. When you have congenital absence of the thymus and parathyroid glands, there's a syndrome to that effect which we call Dijord's syndrome. So in Dijord's syndrome, a patient does not have the thymus and the parathyroid glands. You can figure out how this patient will present clinically based on you knowing the functions of the thymus and the parathyroid glands. Right now, let's finish with the pituitary gland. On this one, we agreed that uh, our main agenda is to just talk about the embryonic sources of the pituitary gland. We will not describe the developmental sequence. The tissues of the pituitary gland are all ectodermal in origin, but there are different ectodermal tissues. Remember that uh, neurulation occurred at some point and that the cranial part of the neurotube forms the brain. This cranial part of the neurotube that forms the brain divides into some vesicles. The forebrain vesicle is what we call the prosencephalon. The midbrain vesicle is called mesencephalon, and the hindbrain vesicle is called rhombencephalon. On the forebrain vesicle, which we call prosencephalon, it later divides into two. Well, two types of vesicles. We have the telencephalon, which gives rise to the cerebral hemispheres, and the diencephalon, which gives rise to what we generally call the diencephalon. The flow of the denkephalon develops a downgrowth. That downgrowth from the flow of the denkephalon is what we call the infundibulum. This infundibulum contributes to formation of the pituitary gland. So, in terms of embryonic site, I've said the flow of the denkephalon. Apart from the flow of the denkephalon, remember denkephalon, if you trace it back, it will be prosencephalon. If you trace it back, it will be neurotube. And in neurotube, if you trace it back, it will be basically neuroectoderm, and that means ectoderm. So I told you that pituitary comes from ectoderm. That's not the only source. The other source is now the lining of the primitive mouth. The lining of the primitive mouth, the primitive mouth is called the, the stomodium. The lining of the stomodium is also lined by, the stomodium is also lined by ectoderm, but now in this case surface ectoderm rather than neuroectoderm. The surface ectoderm at the roof of the stomodium, where we expect to have the future pharynx, the surface ectoderm at the roof of the stomodium is the one that gives rise to the other part of the pituitary gland. So what happens here? This is what happens. From the roof of the primitive pharynx or from the roof of the stomodium, there develops an outgrowth again, a diverticulum, and that diverticulum appears like that one. After it has developed, it buds off 
from the surface of the pharynx. That thing is what we call the Rathke's pouch. So the Rathke's pouch buds off from the roof of the primitive pharynx and migrate upwards to join with the infundibulum. So those two are the ones which contribute to formation of the pituitary gland. I want you to note that both structures are of ectodermal origin. But now, how do we account? The one that arises from the roof of the stromodium, what you are calling the Rathke's pouch. The Rathke's pouch is the one that contributes to formation of the adeno hypothesis. Remember, the hypothesis is what is commonly vaguely called the anterior pituitary gland. And then the other part of the pituitary gland, which we call the neurohypophysis, or vaguely called the posterior pituitary gland. So the neurohypophysis is the one that arises from the floor of the delcephalon, the structure we are calling the infundibulum. Those two meet, so neurohypophysis will grow down, and adenohypophysis grows up, then the two meet and envelop one another. The cavity of the Rathke's pouch will still be present. And that cavity of the Rathke's pouch, which is present, is the intraglandular cleft. It remains as the intraglandular cleft, which usually separates the pus distalis from the pass intermedia of the adenohypophysis. So the main story here is that pituitary gland has dual embryonic origin. Neurohypophysis arises from the floor of the denkephalon, which is a neuroectodermal structure. The adenohypophysis arises from the, stom the roof of the stomodium as the Rathke's pouch which is basically the surface ectodermal structure. So in terms of uh, anomalies, the only thing I want to talk about is that we may have some remnants of the Rathke's pouch along the migratory path. The tissues of the Rathke's pouch along the migratory path of the pituitary gland may give us some trouble. Maybe there's some tissues of the Rathke's pouch that will remain along the roof of the pharynx or somewhere. And so some people have used the term pharyngeal pituitary gland to refer to that concept. That might be really, really rare, but a more common thing would be when these various remnants of the Rathke's pouch do not actually involute but proliferate slowly to become a tumor. Such tumors are known as craniopharyngioma. So craniopharyngiomas are tumors, they are benign tumors which arise from the remnants of the Rathke's pouch. So in this image we see, maybe you're not familiar with MRI of the brain, but uh, that is where the tumor is, which I'm calling craniopharyngioma, we still see it around the level of the cella tussica of the brain. Right, so that's what I had for you in this particular lecture. We will end it there. Remember, this is part of a large lecture series on development of the head and neck structures. So we've just done the second part, which is on development of endocrine glands of head and neck. The third part, you watch out for it, will be now on development of the face or facial structures and we'll focus on the tongue, the palate and uh, the whole face at large. Thank you very much. We'll stop there for today.